I'm taking a class this semester through Harding in their Northwest Arkansas campus. It's called Multicultural Counseling. And as a part of the class, we're supposed to watch films, and these films are supposed to challenge us to think more multiculturally. And so one of the movies I watched this week is called Slumdog Millionaire. It takes place in the slums of Mumbai, India. I have to admit to you that uh, this movie was pretty challenging. Since I'm taking it for a class, I, I try to uh, do more than just analyze its entertainment value. I try to think of it in terms of what I'm watching and its impact on me as a person and potentially as a counselor. So if you think about a, a picture like this of the, go to the next slide, uh, of the, these, these boys sitting on this styrofoam raft floating in this filth. It was difficult for me to realize that this kind of poverty still exists in the world today, in our modern age. Or to see these children who are playing games on top of trash, because this is their backyard, this is their playground, this is where they live. Or to see this boy in one scene who is covered in filth, who runs up to this star who's coming on a helicopter to get his autograph. So as I, as I think about this film and its impact on me, I, I thought about different words, compassion, uh, depression. But the word that applied to me mostly was this word, is the word privilege privilege. And so I had to write a paper on it, and this is an excerpt from what I wrote. I suppose that it is human nature to normalize one's privilege, to either deny its existence or to think that one somehow deserves it. This film challenged my sense of normality and exposed me to a world I scarcely knew existed in modern times. I know no one who lives in garbage and human waste. I could almost smell the stench. Imagine a world of thugs, warlords, child trafficking. Imagine having to be clever thieves in order to find food, water, and shelter. Imagine a world where the police use electric shock and other violence to interrogate its own people. Imagine being called a worthless slum dog. I am a man of privilege, and this film has shown a spotlight on this truth. Today's lesson begins with a consideration that we are privileged people. We are privileged not only where we live, this also casts the spotlight on how privileged I am in the blessings that God has given me. This week I uh, had a weak moment and I was complaining about all the things around my house that were broken. Has anybody seen me walking around town? Some? A few people? A couple of you have. I, I just decided just for exercise sake to walk more around town. I had, I've had nine people stop to assist me <laughs> in my walks. I said, no, it's okay. I'm just walking for fun. <laughs> but uh, in, in those weak moments, you know, I, had, I was having car problems. Everything seemed to be broken. And I was feeling sorry for myself. I thought, man, I'm such a person of privilege. So I drive a 30-year-old truck. People all over the world live in trash. So how can I... Um, and I be so selfish that I would want even more when so many in the world have so, so little, but yet seem to find a way to be happy even with that little that they have. So today's lesson begins by considering this privilege. And I would like to even for, for us today to consider the privilege that we have of being invited by God to be close to him. That's a privilege that we don't 
hold just for ourselves. It's an invitation that is given to the world, to the rich and to the poor, to those who have and to those who have not. And so I want you to, to think in this aspect of privilege that we are privileged not only in being able to sit in an air-conditioned building and enjoy a worship together, but we're privileged that God loves us. And we're privileged that we've been invited to his feast. Uh, we are privileged that we are a part of his church and can be close to him. And I think if we aren't careful that we can become so used to our privilege that we don't enjoy it, that we don't even realize how special it is. Turn your Bibles to Matthew 22. We're going to read about this great invitation, this invitation of privilege. Matthew 22. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servant to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. He sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened calf have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention. And they went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army to destroy the murderers and burn their city. He said to his servant, the wedding banquet is, is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. And so the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. The king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Now we're going to look at who this man was. Who was the man who was not wearing wedding clothes? Who does he represent? We'll look at that later in the lesson. The invitation of God is the greatest invitation that you and I will ever receive. This is the third in the line of a, the same themed parables or stories Jesus has told. After the sons of the tenants of the vineyard of last week, now it is the wedding banquet the king sends his servants out to remind the guests to come, but they refuse. Of course, the wedding represents the kingdom of God. We are all invited. And we've got to wake up and understand that to be invited to God's feast is a privilege. The fact that Jesus loves mankind, it's a privilege. That God offered his son to redeem me and you is a privilege. That God wants me is a privilege. We are privileged people. We are privileged because we are blessed by being invited to God's feast that he loves us so. Let's consider then the people in this parable. First, the privileged guests who refuse to come. Consider that sometimes the people of privilege are the least receptive because they deny or refuse to see their own brokenness. In the parable, the original guests paid no heed to the invitation, even when it was extended politely a second time. They carry on their lives as if they had not been invited in the first place. This is equivalent to people hearing the word of God brought by Jesus and willfully ignoring it, preferring the lures of the flesh and the comforts of the world. In fact, the master says in verse 8, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. They were people of privilege. They were the privileged, honored, first invited guests. They were asked to come. They were reminded to come, but they didn't come. Now I want you to think. We are the privileged. 
God invites us. Will we be as these and spurn the invitation? Secondly, the street corner guests come and they fill the hall. He's gone out into, as one, um, one of the gospel writers says, into the highways and byways and compelled them to come in. The imagery of God as the king opening his doors, his table, and his arms to guests is a beautiful testament to his abounding love, generosity, and care for mankind. He cares for the privileged, and he cares for the underprivileged, the rich and the poor, the ones sitting in the air-conditioned building, and the ones living in the slums of India. Because each person has a valuable soul that God wants. He loves the people, not for what's happening to their bodies, but because of the intrinsic worth of their souls. Jeff James sent me a, a video this week, of a, a YouTube video, of a man who was making a plea similar to this, and I want to share with you a couple of quotes from it. It's called, God Saves Bad People. God saves bad people to show the glory of his grace and the extent of the boundaries of his love. Isn't that great? Our complaints to God are rooted in our belief that we approach him from a position of innocence. Have you forgotten the sewer out of which God rescued you? It makes no difference how ugly your sin is. You are not beyond the reach of God's grace. The gracious, generous, warm-hearted God. The God who is for sinners. William Barclay has written on this topic. Those gathered could never by any stretch of their imagination, have expected an invitation to the king's feast. Even more, they would never claim that they had deserved it. It came to them from nothing other than the wide-armed, open-hearted, generous hospitality of the king. It was grace which offered the invitation and grace which gathered men in. It's because God loves men so much. It's such a privilege, a privilege to be invited. Do we understand this privilege? If we refuse the invitation of Christ, someday our greatest pain will lie not in the things we suffer, but in the realization of the precious things we have missed. Thirdly, is the man wearing the wedding clothes who's cast out, or is not wearing wedding clothes who is cast out? Who is this person? Who's the man without the proper clothes? Who does he represent? Who is he? The man without proper clothes is the man who came not with the clothes of penitence, but with an overdeveloped sense of entitlement. He comes with his body and not with his heart. When the Bible refers to clothes, it's, Paul writes, clothe, your, clothe yourself with compassion. It's the spiritual clothing that this man doesn't have. He doesn't come with a, a contrite heart. He doesn't come with a penitent heart. He comes with his body and not with his soul. It has nothing to do with what clothes we wear. It has everything to do with the preparation of our minds and our souls before we come. The garment of the soul is what matters. The door is open to all men, and when we come, we must come wearing the garment of humble penitence, the garment of faith, the garment of reverence. These are the garments without which we ought not approach God. And if we approach God with the clothing of entitlement, we will be cast out. It is God's great desire that mankind accept his invitation. But don't forget, 
to bring your heart. All things are ready. Come to the feast. Sing with me. All things are ready. Come to the feast. Come for the table now is spread. Ye famishing, ye weary, come, and thou shalt be richly fed. Hear the invitation, come whosoever will, praise God. today that we can admit how privileged we are and that with privilege comes a great honor but also responsibility I pray Lord that we will never approach you from our own position of entitlement or pride but always from the position of brokenness and to know that you can take wounded people like us and provide for us the great salvation that comes only through Jesus. I'm so thankful that you have invited us to your feast. That you've invited us to dine with you. To be close to you. To be treated as a son and as a daughter. And I pray, Lord, that our privilege of wealth will not ruin us and will not make us spurn the invitation, will not give us a, a sense that we don't need you or don't want you and have no desire to know you. I pray, Lord, that you will soften our hearts then. And as we consider today the privilege not only of what you've given us and the place you've allowed us to live, and but that we will also acknowledge our brokenness and will be appreciative of the great invitation that you've given us. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. Number two, the greatest traps. Don't worry, the last two points we'll do tonight, so don't panic. Let's consider now um, verses 15 through 33. 15 through 33. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know you are a man of integrity, that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. You know, I, you, can, you can hear them saying it this way. Teacher, we know you're a man of integrity and that you do not teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. It's so phony. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me a coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose portrait is this? And whose inscription? 
Caesar's, they replied. He said to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And when they heard this, they were amazed and they left him and went away. That same day, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses told us if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and have children for him. Now there were seven brothers among us. One married and one, the first one married and died, and since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and third brother, right on down to the seventh. Finally, the woman died. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven, since all of them were married to her? Now understand, this question's being posed by people who do not believe in the resurrection. Jesus replied, You are in error because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teachings. Unbelievably, the Pharisees still have not learned their lesson, but are still trying to entrap Jesus. One might have thought that by now they would have realized it, that it was not possible. They're still trying. They are the privileged guests. They are the ones who had every reason to accept the invitation. They are the privileged who spurned the invitation of God. Rather, they find themselves entangled in self-promotion and self-protection. They are bogged down in legalities and an obsessive pursuit of the small print. Now, I think it is important any time we look at scriptures like this that we put ourselves as the recipients of this teaching. That we don't just think of this as Jesus being hard on the Jews, but we think of it as a way to challenge ourselves because we are the privileged. Could we find ourselves entangled in self-promotion and self-protection? Could we find ourselves bogged down in legalities and an obsessive pursuit of the small print? Could we find ourselves as those who have every reason to accept the invitation but haven't? I wonder are there those among us who have heard the invitation many, many times but are still waiting, spurning the invitation? Listen, we are all broken people. We all need to accept the invitation. Consider then these potential traps. I've called them potential traps. Some of them are reflected in um, these questions that the, the leadership asked Jesus. These are potential traps because they are potentially the things that keep us from accepting the invitation. Self-importance. No wish to attend. Rebellion. Lack of interest. Busyness. I will attend to the things of God someday. Wrong priorities, as reflective in the, the crowded soil that Jesus spoke of in the parable of the sower. Distraction. And here, where the questions are asked with a misunderstanding of Scripture or only partial truth. All of these things, and we could add to this, to this list, all of these things, potential traps, things that keep us from answering the invitation of God, things that have us concentrating on the things that don't matter rather than the things that are eternal. It is so easy for man to be so busy with the things of time 
that he forgets the things of eternity. The invitation of God is the greatest invitation we will ever receive. To be invited is a privilege. The fact that Jesus loves me is a privilege. That God offered his son to redeem me is a privilege. That he invites me is a privilege. It is God's great desire that mankind accept his invitation. All things are ready. Come to the feast. Man, we are so privileged. God is so good. His love is so abounding. May we love him by accepting his great invitation. If you'd like to respond this morning, will you come now as we sing?